For the last three months, I've been working on building an MMO with Godot and a custom backend that I made in .NET. Today, I want to give an overview of the project, the architecture, and show what I've been able to implement. The main goal of the project is to build a RuneScape-inspired MMO in Godot, so I've been focused on building out the systems to support on the order of thousands of players doing basic things like chopping a tree or fishing. Most of the work has been on the server, and so the game client I'm showing off isn't really you know, like a finished product. I mean, not even close. It's really like a bare minimum to show that the features work. The focus for me has been to build out the back end, the infrastructure, and also some automated tests. There's some really cool tricks I've implemented to make this kind of development easy, and uh, I'm excited to show it off. First, let's talk about server capacity. What's an MMO without lots of players? What you're looking at here is a test I did with my game servers deployed to Azure, running about a thousand clients connected simultaneously. It ran relatively smoothly on the incredibly cheap Azure infrastructure that I provisioned, and uh, that's what you're seeing here. Now there's two reasons I didn't push it beyond a thousand users. Bandwidth is really expensive and I haven't spent the time to fully optimize the communication between the server and the clients. And I'll show you how much that actually cost me. And then two, I felt like a thousand was a good proof of concept given that like a RuneScape world is 2000 players and I expect to be able to exceed that. This test was a thousand all in the same zone, which is like a worst case scenario for my infrastructure. A thousand players spread out all over the world would be way easier on the server. So I just wanted to shoot through some of the features I've been able to implement over the last few months. So here we have multiplayer, we have melee combat, woodcutting, and other skilling like mining or fishing would be basically the same code as woodcutting, ranged combat, we have loot drops and looting and inventories and all that kind of stuff, and then last most recently I implemented like teleportation. Here's a high level overview of the architecture of the game. So we'll start at the bottom. You have your game clients. They can be connected to these SignalR servers. SignalR is basically a WebSocket service for .NET. So there's a WebSocket connection between each game client and one of the SignalR servers. There can be any number of these. I just chose three randomly, but you can have a hundred, you can have one. So they maintain this persistent connection and that's how messages get from the game client to the back end, the game back end and back. So when a client wants to send a message, say, hey, I want to move to some tile, it sends it through the SignalR server and then that has a connection to the game back end. So Orleans is the framework I'm using to manage the back end servers. So this is basically the game server as you would think of it. So this is where things like the player's inventory and the player's movement and location and combat, like all of that's happening up here. SignalR is just a communication bus between them. And so the SignalR server and the Orleans servers are each a Kubernetes deployment. So each one of these SignalR instances would be like a pod in a Kubernetes deployment. So yeah, it's a relatively simple flow from 30,000 feet. I thought maybe it'd be helpful to zoom in where the actual game logic takes place, which is inside one of these Orleans, you know, VMs or pods or, you know, whatever instances. All right, so this is slightly zoomed in on the Orleans backend. And then each one of these columns represents a pod or server, basically. And I color-coded these to represent one player. So like this is the green player, and the green player has a what's called a grain, a player controller grain. So each one of these small boxes is called a grain. That's like an Orleans terminology, and I, I can have a separate video on Orleans in the future. Um, super cool framework and, and really great uh, community. So when a player logs in, they get a player controller grain, a movement grain, an inventory grain, and lots of other ones. I just included a few. And even NPCs have grains, right? So the NPC has some logic and it also has a movement grain that's basically the same code as the players. So whenever a player wants to move, that input goes into the player controller grain and then it asks the movement grain you know, for a path and sends that back to the client, and then the movement grain can start crunching away on moving it tick after tick. Another example might be if a player wants to interact with their inventory, that goes through their player controller grain, and then in this case, this green player would have to make a call over the network, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, I mean, it, it is a network, but it's on the same data center in Azure, and so it, it, it would be extremely fast. This partitioning of grains across servers is where like the horizontal scaling of the system kind of 
comes into play. If things start getting too crazy, too many grains happening on one server. Then what you can do is you can just add more servers and it'll start spreading these out. So if you add another server, then like maybe some of these things would get moved around. Um, there's also logic in Orleans to say, hey, if this grain is communicating a lot with this grain and it's, it's very consistent communication, then why don't we just move this grain over here? So that way there's no communication across this network. And then it, there probably is something similar would happen with this one. And so over time you would just eventually get these uh, more efficiently placed, I guess you would say. Another thing that can happen is that a server could get destroyed. So like I might turn it off to save money or it might need to be rebooted for some reason. And so Orleans will dynamically rearrange these so that we can, you know, play will continue, if that makes sense, with, with minor hitching. Um, I haven't gotten this to work perfectly. Um, there's still work to be done on like scaling up and down being completely seamless. I, I don't know if it can ever be fully seamless, but it's getting there. The last thing I wanted to look at is just give an overview of what happens on each game tick and how, how that kind of flows through. So there's actually one server tick. It's actually a, it's a grain in Orleans with a timer. And so the ticks run on 100 millisecond um, ticks. So there's 10 ticks a second, which is significantly different from RuneScape. If I remember right, RuneScape is like 0.6 second ticks. Um, and so there's only, you know, barely not even two ticks per second. So and I'm doing 10 ticks a second because I wanted it I wanted to experiment with like the fluidity of it of the of the game, how that affects what would RuneScape be like if it had ten ticks a second instead of one and or three quarters or whatever it is. And so the flow is that the server tick grain calls tick on each zone. So like the game is split up into segments, like little square segments, and I call those zones. They're they're small. And so when players travel between zones, they get kind of assigned to a zone. So when a zone gets ticked, it ticks each player inside of it. It actually also ticks um, NPCs as well. So like you could imagine there's, um, there's an NPC in here as well, and, and that would also get ticked. And so whenever a player gets ticked, we tick their player controller, and then their player controller ticks any kind of sub-components of a player that need to get ticked, like their combat grain and their movement grain, things like that. Anything that does work on a per-tick basis. I think a good place to start with how things work is looking at a test. So here's a test that shows that when you start cutting down a tree or something like that, you know, I call it skilling here, that eventually an item gets added to your inventory, like a log. The first step is to create a player. And this is a good place to see all the different components that make up a player. So you can see you have an ID for the player and they have a controller, movement, inventory, their session, which is like every time you log in, you get a new session. They have stats. Uh, social is like party management and instances. I didn't really touch on that much. Combat, crafting, I didn't touch on, but there's uh, crafting implemented, but not in the client. And then quests, which is also a backend thing, but not in the client yet. So we've got our player, they're logged in, and the next thing we need to do is add an item. So this adds like a fake test item to the game uh, with a category of axe because woodcutting you know, re requires an axe. So we can add that item to their inventory. And then for this test, I'm setting their woodcutting level to 10 because the node that they're gonna be chopping requires that they are level 10. And then this is a start skilling node request. So this is the thing that the player client sends to the server. Everything from the client is in the form of a request. So the client doesn't just say, I'm gonna go chop this tree. The client says, I would like to chop this tree at this location. And then it's up to the server to figure out, do you meet all the requirements? Can you get there? Things like that. So here's this request to the server saying, hey, I wanna start this skilling node, which in this case is a tree. And the server returns back, hey, did you start or not? And this assert true just checks, did we actually successfully start chopping the tree? If we've started chopping the tree, then we can grab how many items are in our inventory, 
And then while there's only one item in our inventory, which is this test item, right? We have an ax. Then let's tick the player controller. And so th this is how the tick system works. So any tickable object in the game can be referred to as an I tickable, and you can call tick on it. And tick takes two arguments. It takes the tick number, which has to go up all the time. So most things won't respond to duplicate ticks. Uh, and then this zero here is like a delta time, which if you're familiar with like game engine ticks, it's basically that. It's the time between the, they're not frames, but it's the time between the ticks. So we tick, and then because there's only a, I think like a 30% chance or something to get a log, this has to be in a while loop. So we do a tick, we grab the number of items again. If it's still only one, we do a tick, grab the number of items again. And yeah, that will continue until you get a log. And then once you get a log, we do another assert. This is actually asserting not just that your inventory size is two, but that your inventory size could be two or three. Because I think right now the way it works is you can get a log and a bird's nest, um, very RuneScape-esque, and so that's how that works. Right now the bird's nest would go into your inventory, so a little bit different, but I don't really have ground items, and I don't know if I plan on adding ground items. Not sure yet. So now if we run this test, we should see that it passes. There you go. And so what's great about this system is that whenever I make a change, I can press one button. And with one button press, I can confirm that all of these features that I've added tests for all work still. And it's super easy to write a test, as you just saw. So I think the obvious next question is, what's next? I think my immediate goal is to keep adding functionality, keep adding features, and although I'm using RuneScape as sort of a inspiration, I don't want to make a RuneScape clone. But in my head, if I'm able to do some of the things RuneScape's able to do, then that is a success in my book. Like, RuneScape is the type of game that I would like to aim toward. So I think the next steps for me would be adding questing, dialogue, talking to NPCs. I'm working on that right now. After that, I intend to implement like a boss mechanic where they have, you know, AOE attacks and things like that, more, more intricate combat. And then I need to spend a lot of time on environment work, client work, polish, UI, to be able to have a demoable game. Let me know if you're interested in any follow-up videos, any technical deep dives on a particular part of this, or if you just want to follow along, feel free to subscribe.